Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching All24 News Live from Algiers. Coming up next in our World News Programme. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken stated after arriving in Ukraine for an official visit that the United States is trying to work on two tracks with Russia. The first is diplomatic and there is another track related to the steps associated with Moscow. Plus. Also coming up in our world news program, the first flights delivering essential relief supplies from New Zealand and Australia have landed with more on the way after the runway of Tonga's main airport was cleansed of ash and debris following last weekend's horrific volcano explosion and tsunami. And marine explorers have discovered pristine rose-shaped corals in what's known as the ocean's twilight zone. Thank you for joining us. First in our top stories in a press conference with his German counterpart Annalena Bayerbock, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken sent a stern warning to Russia threatening to pay the price if it invaded Ukraine. Hossein Berkin reports. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Berlin for four-way talks with counterparts from France and Germany, as well as Britain's junior foreign minister. During a press conference with the German Minister for Foreign Affairs Annalena Barbock, Blinken stated that if any Russian forces penetrate Ukraine, the U.S. and its allies will respond firmly, stressing that their union will give them the necessary strength, emphasizing that Russia cannot face this solidarity. All of these engagements are part of wide-ranging, ongoing consultations uh, with our European allies and partners, more than a hundred in recent weeks alone, including with Ukraine, NATO, the European Union, the OSCE, the Bucharest Nine, as well as many bilateral conversations with individual countries to ensure that we are speaking and acting together with one voice when it comes uh, to Russia. That unity uh, gives us strength. Uh, a strength, I might add, that Russia does not and cannot match. It's why we build voluntary alliances and partnerships in the first place. It's also why Russia recklessly seeks to divide us. With regard to Iran nuclear deal, Anthony Blinken affirmed that if an agreement has not been reached in the upcoming weeks, it will be impossible to return to the AGCPOA. If a deal is not reached in the coming weeks, Iran's ongoing nuclear advances, which resumed after we withdrew from the agreement, will make it impossible for us to return to the JCPOA. So we discussed in detail how we can reach an understanding in Vienna and what we'll do if Iran rejects a mutual return to compliance and full implementation. It was a very productive discussion. Blinken is scheduled to meet with the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to set up a common strategy against Moscow before heading to Geneva to meet with his Russian colleague Sergei Lavrov. Amid rising tension between Moscow and Kiev, experts say Kharkiv, a tech hub 40 kilometers from the Russian border, could be the first city to face an attack. The metropolis is simply a thriving ex exertion hub with more than 45,000 non-migratory. IT specialists fear that a potential invasion by Russian army might cause severe damage. U.S. President Joe Biden described the first year of his presidency as full of major challenges. In a press conference to the nation, Biden also reviewed in the one-year anniversary of his assumption of office the most important files his administra administration has faced since entering the White House. Hussein Berkan again. America is back. One year since taking office, President Joe Biden held a press conference in which he tried to ride the ship as his administration continues to face challenges. Joe Biden said that his administration achieved enormous progress during his first year in office, so help me God. but stressed that he would continue to tackle key challenges including COVID-19 and rising prices. We have faced some of the biggest challenges that we've ever faced in this country these past few years. Challenges to our public health, challenges to our economy, but we're getting through it. And not only are we getting through it, we're laying the foundation for future where America wins the 21st century by creating jobs at a record pace. Now we need to get inflation under control. 
In the most important foreign challenge, Joe Biden threatened Russia that the consequences are going to be disastrous if the Kremlin decided to invade Ukraine and emphasized that Washington and its allies' partners are ready to impose severe costs and significant harms to the Russian economy. But if they actually do what they're capable of doing with the force of mass on the border, it is going to be a disaster for Russia if they further invade Ukraine, and that our allies and partners are ready to impose severe cost and significant harm on Russia and the Russian economy. In addition to that, Putin has a, you know, has a, a stark choice, uh, he, either de-escalation or diplomacy, a confrontation of the consequences. When asked about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, Joe Biden affirmed that he does not regret it and described Afghanistan as the grave of empires and that it's not susceptible to unity. A trillion dollars a week. I mean, a billion dollars a week in Afghanistan for 20 years. It's been the graveyard of empires for a solid reason. It is not susceptible to unity. I have a great concern for the women and men who were blown up on the line at the airport by a terrorist attack against them. It's worth mentioning that Biden approval rating among Americans is dropping due to the pandemic, which shows no sign of ending, while his legislative program faces an uphill struggle in the face of split Congress and the inflation that is wrecking on the economy. On top of a once-in-a-generation a epidemic, Joe Biden has inherited an economy in shambles and COVID-19 cases soured and a country so split that this president, sir, supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol two weeks previously in an attempt to halt his rise. Sofian Kinturi reports. Over the last year, Biden managed to get some of his top priorities passed through Congress but remained stammered on others leaving him with less than a year to work with Democrats to pass his legislative agenda before the next Congress is sworn in following the 2022 midterm elections. He also used the executive branch power to send 77 executive orders in his first year in office, outpassing his predecessors, former President Donald Trump, who signed 55 executive orders in the same time, former President Barack Obama, who signed 41, and former President George Bush, who signed 56, according to data from the Federal Register. Here are the top five bills Biden sent into law this year. President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, swapping $1.9 trillion package into law in early March, the series of measures. In November, Biden signed the legislation into law which is infuses $1.2 trillion into Americans' traditional hard infrastructure, such as road and bridges. The president also signed two swap cape measures, one late September and one in December, to avoid a government shutdown. And a bill into law in the summer establishing June 19 as a Juneteenth National Independence Day, a U.S. federal holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the U.S. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which banned imports from China's Xinjiang region, was signed into law in December. Nearly two years into the pandemic, the U.S. is grappling with the surge of Omicron variant, with cases and hospitalizations again on the rise in many states across the country. We've lost 400,000 small businesses. All those empty storefronts aren't just shattered dreams. There are uh, warning lights that are going off in state and local budgets that are... The centerpiece of Biden's domestic agenda, a nearly $2 trillion climate and economic spending package, remains stalled in the Senate amid opposition from Democrat sense. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the three people standing next to me here for what they've agreed to do to help. We're talking about American innovation, American products, American labor. We're talking about the health of our families and cleaner water, cleaner air, and uh, cleaner communities. Biden came into office vowing to restore the U.S. credibility on the world stage and is currently facing several foreign policy challenges that will test that promise. U.S. President Joe Biden has risked further destabilizing the Russian-Ukraine crisis with his harsh warning to Moscow, the Kremlin said. 
On Wednesday, Biden told reporters at the White House, quote, Russia will be held accountable if it invades and it depends on what it does. It is going to be a disaster for Russia if they further invade Ukraine. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said on Thursday, the comments, quote, in no way contribute to diffusing the tension that has now arisen in Europe. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi said on Wednesday Tehran is faced with no limitation for developing relations with Moscow. According to the Iranian president's website, the Iranian web president made the remarks in a meeting with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin during his visit to the Russian capital Moscow. At least two people have been killed and dozens more wounded after an explosion in a busy shopping district in the eastern Pakistani city of Lahore. The explosion took place in the Lohari Gate area, a densely packed neighborhood consisting of small shops packed into narrow crisscrossing streets on Thursday afternoon. An investigation into Downing Street parties has found an email from a senior official to Prime Minister Boris Johnson's private secretary warning that a May 20th, 2020 party should not go ahead, ITV's political editor said on Thursday. And now the first foreign aid planes have arrived in Tonga, bearing much-needed supplies for the Pacific nation, which was left devastated by a volcanic eruption and subsequent tsunami on Saturday. Marwa Belaywa reports. Australia and New Zealand officials announced that their aid flights reached Tonga. They said two large military transports touched down at Tonga's main airport after its runway had been cleared of ash, making it safe to land. The shipment of relief supplies is the first to arrive in Tonga after the eruption of the Hunga Tonga underwater volcano. The eruption spread a thick layer of ash across the island and caused a tsunami that was felt across the Pacific. Rescue teams and hundreds of volunteers had four days desperately worked to clear the thick layer of ash at the airport runway in the capital that had prevented planes from landing. The flights carried humanitarian supplies and telecommunications equipment. The Australian High Commission in Tonga said earlier that Australia had provided one million Australian dollars to the recovery effort. Australian Defence Minister Peter Dutton tweeted the first plane dispatched by the Australian Defence Forces had landed, carrying humanitarian assistance and disaster relief supplies. New Zealand's C-130 Hercules aircraft carrying aid supplies also landed in Tonga and a second one is expected to land tomorrow. The delivery of supplies was contactless. According to officials, Tonga is COVID-free and is worried that the virus could spread to the island along with aid deliveries. Gambian President Adama Barro has pledged to work to jumpstart the economy as he was sworn in for a second five term in office near the capital Banjul. Barrow, 56, came to power in 2017 by unseating his predecessor Yahya Jame at the polls. He comfortably won a re-election last month with 53% of the first round vote. The UN expressed concerns over the evictions of families from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan neighborhoods of East Al Quds, and four European countries have also called the Zionists to stop the construction of illegal settlers' units in East Al Quds. Miriam Zian reports. Torwensland, the special UN envoy for the Middle East peace process, expressed concern about the potential eviction of a number of Palestinian families from homes they have lived in for decades in East al Quds neighborhoods of Sheikh al-Jarrah and Silban, as well as the risk of escalating violence as a result of such actions. By the potential eviction of a number of Palestinian families from homes they have lived in for decades in Sheikh Jarrah and Silban neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, and the risk that such actions pose for escalating violence. I call on Israeli authorities to end the displacement and evictions of Palestinians in line with its obligation under international law. In a speech at a Security Council briefing on the Middle East situation, the special coordinator called on the Zionists to end the displacement and eviction of the Palestinians. 
as required by international law, and to approve additional plans that would allow Palestinian communities to build legally and address their development needs. The UN will continue to actively engage, along with its counterparts in the Middle East Quarter, with regional and international partners and with Zionist and Palestinian leaders to reach a just, comprehensive and lasting settlement of Palestinian Zionist conflict. Four European nations have also urged the Zionist entity to hold the construction of illegal settlement units in East Al Quds, as the state continues to defy international law by expanding its land grab and forced displacement programs in the occupied Palestinian territories. China's observed shift from the so-called Nine Dash Line toward a new legal theory to bolster its claims in the South China Sea region could create new challenges for India's interests in the area. This shift has been noticed by member countries of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and is, an, and is even more serious than the old claim. Authorities decided to kill 2,000 hamsters and close the pet shops in fear of a possible animal-to-human COVID-19 transmission. The decision broke hearts of pet owners and was highly criticized. Miriam Zian again. Two SARS-CoV-2 positive persons were enough for Hong Kong authorities to decide to exterminate 2,000 hamsters and close all pet shops as they didn't know how the illness has spread in the shops. Authorities are urging pet owners to leave their animals. This action, as strange as it is, comes as authorities fail to pinpoint the source of the current epidemic wave, which began three months ago. A pet owner thought the government's approach was unfair and overbroad. I did think of not turning them in. The first thing I did was to get myself tested and to get my whole family tested, but after consideration, there are so many unknowns, so this was the only thing we could really do. Why would they strongly advise us to turn in our animals? What I mean is, it remains unclear whether animals can be affected by the virus, or how long it will affect them for. No one knows. The government isn't saying that they will give the pets back if they test negative. They are euthanizing the animals after testing regardless. There is nothing we can do. Uh, which is about 200. Um, During Tuesday's COVID-19 briefing, the controller of the Center for Health Protection, Edwin Tsu, stated that the illness may have come from one of two sources, the human-to-human -human transmission or an animal-to-human transition, which is rare. The director of the Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, AFCD, declared that hamster samples gathered from the shop had developed the virus and that 2,000 hamsters and other small animals will be slaughtered due to worries of COVID-19 infections. People who bought hamsters on or after December 22 were encouraged to turn in their rodents for testing. The tech-heavy Nasdaq Composite Index ended the trading day on Wednesday down 10.7% from its November the 19th closing record high. Wall Street's main index is confirming it was in a correction after a diverse set of corporate earnings and as investors continue to worry about the higher U.S. Treasury yields and the Federal Reserve tightening monetary policy. The Nasdaq's last correction was in early 2021 when the tech-heavy index fell more than 10% from February the 12th to March the 8th. And following the visit which took place in the Algerian province of Khenshla, the American mission in Algeria has visited another province in the south of Algeria, particularly Wed Souf, to attend another B2B meeting. The U.S. mission toured some agricultural areas in El Wed. The delegation has been to many agrarian sites in the area, starting with Daiwa Farm, where a short presentation made by Mr. Shihun to explain how cultivation is done there. The next destination was the Tarfawi Manufactory, which is about 15 kilometers far from the farm, and it was a chance for the American expedition to see more about the city. The journey in the state aims at displaying the major and the most agricultural productions in the whole country, including dates and potatoes. The B2B meeting was has been held in La Gazelle d'Or Resort, which introduced the Turkish agricultural rep representatives of Atlas Group. 
A presentation has been made by the attendants in which they talked about the plans, the potentials and the country's diversity in the agrarian sector. Uh, today we were able to meet together as American businessmen and an Algerian delegation to work towards the progress of the agriculture in Algeria. There's a unlocked potential, unlimited potential here in Algeria that we are trying to unlock and reach as together. And today was a wonderful opportunity on how we can get there as a company, as a group, to work together. Uh, there is wonder, wonderful uh, progress on companies in America working with businessmen in Algeria and developing thousands and thousands of hectares and cattle here with your potato production and hay production, corn production, everything. And we're super excited to be here and hopefully we can make a difference with our company here and help Algeria unlock that potential. I've been working in the Middle East and North Africa for some time, worked in Egypt, worked in Sudan. This is my second trip to Algeria, but uh, it's got a huge agriculture potential here. And of course, I'm in the dairy sector and Algeria is importing much, much uh, milk powder. And really it shouldn't be so because of the uh, potential agriculture here. They should be making enough to support their own needs as well as exporting to all of Africa and the Middle East. So my job here is to help uh, pot uh, potential Algerian customers achieve this goal of having large high efficiency dairies that can feed their country plus all of Africa and the Middle East. And for more news around the world about COVID-19, let's follow this report by Marwa Belaywar. India saw its COVID-19 infections reach an eight-month high on Wednesday. Amid warnings, it will take weeks before its Omicron peak is reached. India recorded a further 282,970 new infections in the latest 24-hour period, its highest levels of COVID cases in eight months. This brings the total to 37.9 million coronavirus cases, which makes it its second highest in the world behind the United States. The COVID-19 positivity rate in Karachi climbed to 41%. Sindh Health Department officials confirmed Thursday morning as the virus continues to tighten its grip over the city with a higher number of infections reported every other day. The official data suggests that 3,149 new infections were detected in Karachi during the last 24 hours after 7,670 diagnostic tests were conducted. The new infections placed the city's positivity ratio to a new high since the pandemic hit. France has registered 464,769 new COVID-19 infections over the last 24 hours, official data showed on Tuesday. The highest ever recorded tally since the start of the pandemic. On the other hand, Italy reports 228,179 coronavirus cases on Tuesday. Hong Kong will suspend face-to-face -face teaching in secondary schools from Monday until after the approaching Lunar New Year, authorities said, because of a rising number of coronavirus infections in several schools in the Chinese-ruled territory. The government halted classes in primary schools and kindergartens early this month and imposed curbs such as a ban on restaurant dining after 6 p.m. and the closure of venues such as gyms, cinemas and beauty salons. And for more news around the world, let's follow these summaries by Miriam Zian. Senators have thwarted President Joe Biden's attempt to safeguard voting rights against what Democrats have seen as an all-out attack on racial minorities by conservative states. The ruling Democrats were unable to push through the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which were enacted by the Chamber of Representatives last week. Due to a roadblock by Republicans in the upper house who complained of federal government overreach. 45-year-old Vietnamese was sentenced by a Belgian criminal court on Wednesday to 15 years in prison for having played a leading role in the smuggling of migrants, which resulted in the death of several dozen of his compatriots in 2019. The bodies of 39 Vietnamese migrants aged between 15 and 44 were found dead on October 2019 in the back of a lorry in the industrial area of Grays, East London. 
The UN Secretary General said on Wednesday he was delighted to learn that a demonstrable effort to make peace in Ethiopia is finally underway. According to information relayed to him by the African Union High Representative for the Horn of Africa. According to a statement released by his spokesperson, Antonio Guterres spoke on the phone with the former Nigerian president, Olosgan Obasanjo, to exchange views on the conflict that has affected millions of people across the country and the rest of the region since fighting began in Tigray in November 2020. A Beijing 2022 official said any athlete behavior contrary to the Olympic spirit or Chinese rules or laws will be subject to certain penalties. The statement came shortly as human rights groups advised athletes to remain silent for the duration of the Games and amid worries about the internet security of participants' data stored in a required phone app. Ingrid Betancourt, a politician who was captured by the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia guerrillas while campaigning for the presidency and held hostage for six years, announced on Tuesday she would run again. She also explained she will participate in the March 13 primaries of the so-called Coalition of Hope, which is made up of the Coalition Hope Center, the Coalition of Experience Right and the Historical Pact Left. And we wrap up our news edition with this piece of information and following the latest results regarding the football match between Algeria and Ivory Coast. The latter has scored 3 to nil against Algeria. With this news, our uh, English news edition comes to an end. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.